um, a great way to uh, sing powerful words of praise to God and uh, uh, to be able to uh, just acknowledge his forgiveness and how awesome it is to be in the midst of it. Uh, and so it is for that and, uh, of course, his, his uh, loving kindness that we worship him uh, this day and at this time. Um, want to remind you that, uh, that we are in the midst of our 90-day prayer journey, and I hope you've been able to uh, engage with that through uh, either the, um, uh, the, the videos, the focuses placed on Facebook or the, uh, the phone calls and uh, be able to uh, create a more intentional uh, rhythm of, of daily prayer. Uh, that will, uh, of course, continue and carry on. Uh, for us, and uh, also want to thank you for uh, for your continued giving. You know, whether it's through uh, sending an in or dropping it off at the office, or in the uh, the box uh, in the back, out at the entrance, uh, or online, uh, we appreciate that so much as it helps our uh, our ministries to uh, to carry on, uh, which are uh, increasingly important uh, in this time. Uh, I want to pray with you, and uh, after we pray, uh, Doug Lewis is going to come up and, uh, and share some words as a call to worship for us this morning. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning um, for your grace and your mercy uh, that is so abundant, it overflows, and uh, at times... Uh, in the midst of our brokenness uh, is overwhelming. Lord, there are times that, uh, that we think, how could you love me? How could you forgive me? And yet we know from your word and the testimony of others that uh, the how uh, is through the amazing love uh, that involved the, uh, the giving, the sacrifice of your son. And so, Lord, we, we praise you for that this morning. We, um, we worship you with that reality in our hearts and our minds. And so, Lord, we ask that, uh, that the words that we sing uh, become increasingly true as they flow out of our mouths uh, and out of our spirit. And, Lord, that the, uh, the words, the message that we hear this morning... Um, continues to kindle a fire within us, uh, to walk in your presence, uh, to know you, uh, and to share um, your tender mercies and your love uh, with everyone around us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. If you have Bibles with you this morning, um, we're going to read a short passage out of James chapter 3. I'll give you a minute to look for that if you want. So that my heading says two kinds of wisdom. Um, James chapter 3, starting with verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by deeds done in humility. That comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and spiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. Father, as we uh, come before you now and sing, may, uh, may our hearts be truly turned to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
You know, Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. To be poor in spirit is to know that I am in desperate need of God. I can do nothing about my condition, but Jesus can. And I know that um, there's not one person who comes before him where there is not a concern on our heart, where there is not something we are walking with or walking through where we don't have questions. And I know this, and I continue to learn that Jesus is always there and he is with us. And when we cry out to him in what we would consider our deepest desperation, he is faithful and he hears us. And even if you think you're in a dry desert place, God has not left you. So I want to pray before we sing these next couple songs and just uh, be mindful of that. Father, Lord, I know your Holy Spirit is moving on us and in us. And Lord, I know that it is, it is truth that there are always those times where we are walking through on certain things, where we may have big questions, where we have uh, uh, deep concerns. Lord, I know that uh, some of us come before you with deep concerns for a loved one, for a friend. So for someone who we are interceding for, we don't understand what you're doing. And, and it's, bringing, um, it's bringing even pain and question into our lives. Lord, I pray that you would remind us that you are with us. That even when it seems as though um, we're not hearing from you, you have not left us. But in our waiting and in our quiet before you, Lord, you meet us where we are. So, Lord, help us to hear your voice. Help us to hear the quietness and the stillness of your voice and to know of your presence, not just this day, but in our daily walk with you. And, Lord, I thank you. I thank you that your name, the name of Jesus, is above and over every name. And we praise you for that in your name. Amen. Father, thank you so much for being with us this day, for meeting with us. And, Lord... We, we, be, we become aware of uh, your holiness and, uh, at, at various times. And one of the things I always think about is we can't even begin to grasp what it means when we think of your holiness. But Lord, you, you allow us to see these glimpses and uh, then these times where, we're, where we just are aware a little bit more of how great and how awesome you are, how pure you are, and how, um, how we are unable to describe um, all those things that are true of you. And Lord, as we meet with you today, help us to turn our hearts with you as we continue to look into your word now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated if you're not already. Um, this morning we're going to be continuing in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Um, and I encourage you to go there if you brought your Bibles or if you look it up on your tablet or iPhone or however it is that you, that you read your Bible. It's just important that you read it. I don't care what you read it on as long as you read it. That, that's what matters. Um, we're looking today at the whole issue of envy. Um, in Proverbs 14, verse 30, it says, A heart of peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. And uh, it's, it's really true, it does. And and I just want to, can you take me out of the monitors a little bit, Steve? I'm getting some feedback here. And this morning, I want to ask us to think about that. And uh, before we get too far into that, we've been going through 90 days of prayer for, um, for America. And we've been seeking him. And, we've been, and different ones have been calling out every day. And we um, encourage you to join us in that. This coming week, we're going to be praying um, for issues, starting a, a series of focus of praying every day for issues around that related to COVID. We're going to be praying this week about, in particular, those who work with the medical aspects of it. You know, so I just want to ask that you listen and look for those short messages and that you find time every day to pray um, concerning those areas. So, so let's pray for that right now. Uh, Father, we are in the midst of 90 days of prayer for America. And it's, uh, it's just a, it's been a humbling thing to be mindful that, um, that when, when we pray, you work and you hear us, and no prayer is wasted. And Lord, uh, issues around COVID the last 10, 11 months or longer have, uh, have changed everything around the world and our nation. Uh, we know that um, 
there are all kinds of issues regarding to medical workers and teams and individuals who have had it in themselves or in their families. And Lord, I pray this week as we focus on those things that you would, would take away uh, things of fear and that you would help us to, uh, to be mindful that you're working in your overall things. I pray that you would raise up your church in that. And uh, we pray and ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I want to read with you, I want to read uh, with you right now that passage uh, beginning uh, just be, uh, begin, just going into verse 1 at the end of 12. It says, And now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the right, with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But then, when perfection comes, the imperfect, will, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child, and I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Before we uh, jump in too far, I want us to pray. We haven't done this in a while, but I want us to pray the Holy Spirit prayer together. I think, it's, I think we have it on the screen here coming up. So uh, if you're able, let's stand together and let's, uh, let's pray this together. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. We're continuing in this series that I'm calling Face to Face. Because when you read in the Word of God about uh, seeing the face of God or coming face to face with God, it is referring to a, an intimate exchange. It's referring to the fact that God knows us deeper than we know ourselves. And, and that God longs for us, and he has done everything for us in his love, so we might have this saving relationship with him. So I'm praying that as we go through uh, this chapter that is commonly called the love chapter, that we, will not only, that we will come to not only a deeper understanding of God's love for us, but as we come to face with that and we know that he is looking deep into us, that we, we will see that God wants me not only to be aware of his love, but he's calling me to make his love known in this world. He's, he's uh, called us to a, this relationship with him, but also in that relationship with him, it changes our relationships with others. It has to. Jesus called us to love. In 1984, the hair was big, right? Anyone remember the 80s? We got some Gen Xers here, right? The hair was big, the bands were loud, the colors were bright, fuchsias and pinks and lime greens and all kinds of stuff. Um, huh? The Tigers won the World Series. The Tigers won the World Series. There's someone that was paying attention. <laughs> that was a minute ago, wasn't it? But I remember I was 16 years of age, and I remember a song came out, and I wasn't a particular fan of the artist, but it was a song that when you heard it, it stuck in your mind all day long. Tina Turner came out with the song, What's Love Got to Do With It, Got to Do With It? Whoa, what's love but a second-hand emotion? 
What's love got to do? I'm sorry, I did not mean to sing. <laughs> Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? That's the last. But anyway, you hear that song, it would be in your mind all day long. And I never wanted to admit that I liked the song or liked Tina Turner, but it stuck in my mind all day long. Every time I heard it, and you heard it a lot in 1984. Um, now, I just want to be clear. I know that Tina's song is no worship tune, and, but I do uh, want to bring attention to the fact that it asks a question that we wrestle with, and it makes a statement that we wrestle with. And that is this, what, what's love got to do with it? We know that love is hard. We know that love hurts. She, she said, what's love but a secondhand emotion? Who needs a heart when a heart can be broken, right? She said, uh, love hurts, it's risky. When we, uh, when we love as Christ loves us, we know that he calls us to love others. And sometimes we we struggle with that because we, we know that when we love as Christ calls us to love, because Christ calls us to this agape love that is unconditional, that is giving, that gives everything. We know that, um, that it's going to cost something. We know that we, 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 will, we walk through some hurt, and sometimes people try to protect themselves from that. But in 1 Corinthians 13, the Apostle Paul is helping us to consider some important truths about love. And he is teaching us about this love of the Lord Jesus Christ, this love that gives everything. And he says, he says in, in this chapter, he says, I want you to consider these truths. I want you to consider this love that trans, so transforms our heart that it draws us into this deeper relationship with Christ. I want, he wants us to see clear of God's love for us, of God's love for others, and he wants that to change our hearts so, so it will change our nature and our character. So we need to ask the big question today. We need to ask, what will we do with this call to love? Because it's more than a call, it's a command. Paul says, I will show you the most excellent way. I can do all kinds of good things, but if I lack love, then I have nothing. Paul also wrote in, in, um, in Galatians 5, he talked about this commandment to love, and he says, um, he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. He says, there'll be evidence in your life of, of your love for Christ, is what he's saying, and there will be fruit. It will be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says these things will be evident in the life of a believer. And we know that Jesus demonstrated love in his actions. We know that uh, Jesus met with those who were considered outcasts, that no one wanted to meet with. Jesus met with them and he loved them. We know that Jesus showed love to people where, that, where others were afraid to even be close to them. We know a lot about that, right? Right? Jesus was, was often uh, considered to be a reckless person because he loved the lepers and others. We know that uh, Jesus showed love to those who were troublemakers. We know that Jesus loved people who were from uh, every spectrum of, of political persuasions of the day. Even his disciples were from different political backgrounds. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the Gospels talk about them arguing four different times. We know that Jesus showed love to those who were rich and had time for them and tried to teach them. We know that Jesus had time and he sought to show love to people who were religious, teachers of the law, Pharisees, and all of that. Sometimes we read those passages, and I read them, and I'm thinking, yeah, Jesus, get them. Tell them. But do you understand? He's spending time with them, answering questions, and debating with them because he loved them. Remember, when Jesus came to this earth, when he arrived here, what did, what did it say in Luke chapter 2? The angel said, I bring you good news of great joy that is for all people. So we need to be mindful of that, that this call to love is, 
is a call to love everyone. Jesus said things uh, in his teaching and in his messages that still mess with us today. He said to, I want you to, uh, to love your enemies. I want you to pray for them. Jesus said, pray for those who persecute you. So what do we do with this, with this difficult command to love? You see, the Bible speaks again and again of God's love for us and speaks again and again of the call or the command to love others. And that command is always in action. The action of the call to love others with this unconditional way. See, sometimes in my walk with the Lord, when, when I'm dealing with, with difficult issues or, um, and things like that, and I, and, I, and I will first go, well, I'm not experiencing love from these people. They're not being patient with me. They're not being kind to me. They're not being. And I think, therefore, since they're not being, I don't have to. But that's not the way the Bible explains this. God calls us to this call to love others as he's loved us. And it's not about um, what others give us. It's about what we give. And the Bible says that we love. 1 John 4, 7 says that we love because he first loved us. So my ability to love others has nothing to do with what they have done to me. It has everything to do with who Jesus Christ is is in me, what he's done for me and for you. That's why the Apostle Paul began 13 with, and now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding God, a gong. I'm only being noisy. See, we are called to love because, uh, because Jesus loved us. In Ephesians, in the, in the fifth chapter, um, the Apostle Paul wrote that as well. In Ephesians chapter um, uh, 5, 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul writes this, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We are called to love, and it is no easy ask. In fact, it is not an ask. It is a command. This is the way in which the authenticity of our faith is known. It is by our love for one another. John also wrote in his letter that that's how people will know that we follow Christ, by how we love one another. Do you wrestle with this? I've wrestled with this. I think we need to wrestle with this. We have to wrestle with this. I wrestle with this often. I've wrestled with this often. Why? Because there are other people in the world. That's why I wrestle with this. Sometimes people are hard to love, right? You know, I just realized something. When you're a preacher, when you say it's hard to love some people, you don't want to make eye contact with anybody. <laughs> You guys are all fine. <laughs> that was just a really hard moment right there. I don't know why. But there are times where, where I wrestle with this because I know that, that it's hard to love as Christ loves me. I mean, I could sit down right now and I could take out a legal pad and you could do the same thing and I could begin to make a list of people that I want to pray for, of people that I'm concerned about, of people that I'm interceding for and and that, uh, that I really am desiring God to move in their life. They're going through some difficult things, or they have a challenge, or they have to make a decision. And I'm praying for them. But I could also turn the page on that legal pad and begin to make another list of, of those of whom I don't naturally desire to pray for. The list might even include... Uh, People that I refuse to pray for. Because for whatever reason, there is not a desire in my heart to see God extend his love to them because of whatever the reason might be. I've decided they don't deserve God's love. 
I don't deserve God's love, but he's extended it to me. I've decided that I have to wrestle with this problem in my life. Because the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. If the, if the cross and Jesus' sacrifice isn't enough for everyone, even those who, who might make my list who I think they don't deserve his love, then there's a problem. You see, when, when, we, when we are praying and we come before God and we're being honest and we find that there, there are, are individuals either a person or groups of people that are in, are in our heart where we desire to see nothing good happen in their life, where we even, we even have decided that we don't want God to work in their life, then that's, that's a problem we need to be concerned with because that is a root that can grow and it will produce envy. And that's what we're looking at the next couple of weeks. You see, the, the Apostle Paul talked about, in, in the chapter before 13, he talked about the importance of the church working together and their different talents and giftedness and all these things that we can do. But then he says, remember, with all that you can do and all that you're gifted to doing, don't do those things outside of loving God with everything. And one of the things he says is love does not envy. And this, this, uh, these parts of, of 1 Corinthians 13 where it says love does not uh, can be uh, difficult parts to work through. I've read through these passages before and I get to the love does not, does not envy, you know. Um, it, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. And I, and I read those things and I go, wow, that's not a problem. I don't do that. But I thought, I was thinking about this this week. Why does he write, love does not? Well, how come he kind of changes that there a little bit? I think he changes it because of this. There are things that we will, are naturally prone to want to do with our human nature. And he's reminding us, hey, love is not envious. Envy is ugly. And it's often the root that will lead to other sins and destructive decisions and choices. If envy is left unconfessed, uh, it will take hold and it will grow and it will never get pretty. It will only get uglier and you will only become more and more discontent and more and more unhappy. Just three years ago, well, coming up on four years ago, in June of 2017, Jeffrey A. Tucker published an article in the Foundation for Economic Education. You're thinking, boy, this sounds exciting. But he published an article entitled Envy Kills. It's a powerful article. I encourage you to read it. If you want a link to it, I'll send it to you. Just drop me an email. But in that article, which is not seeking to be a Christian article, it is simply an article that is laying out logically the problem of envy. The author clearly defines of how envy uh, has become normalized and a detrimental force in our society. And he makes a very strong case that we, as a, as a nation, are losing the awareness of the, destruction, of the destructive effects of envy. I cannot tell you how many times I've read uh, these, few ver these parts of 1 Corinthians 13 and just never, ever thought about envy in a very deep way. But we need to. So what do we need to know about envy? I want to unpack just a few things this morning. First of all, envy, envy is this attitude that, that looks down on the success of another or others. We need to know that envy is deeper than simply coveting or wanting what is not yours. It's more than that. It's a deeper problem than, than just saying, well... I wish that person's nice car was my nice car. It's deeper than that. Envy may observe the excellence of another or the achievement of another or the good things in their life or the perception that they have had it better than me or they have made choices that were worse than my choices or they have done 
more bad things than me. It's probably not good grammar, but you get the point. So they don't deserve what they have or their position or whatever. And Envy says, I want that to stop. It's not about, it's now more than about me wanting what they have. It's that I don't want them to have what they have. Envy moves from, uh, to a, a wanting to see another punished for what they have. It moves to a desire to want to see destruction come to the success of another because, simply because one's determined that they don't deserve that and I won't be happy till they don't have it any longer. Aristotle said of envy that it is pain at the sight of another's good fortune stirred by those who have what we ought to have. It's a lying tool of the enemy, and we need to know that. And the problem with, with, uh, with envy is when, when envy begins to take hold in your life, um, we begin to believe that somehow we are, are justified and will only be happy when someone else is not happy. And we, we lose the ability to rejoice with them. And the problem is because envy is, envy is a a tool of the enemy, it lies, it, it only, it never, never brings us to a point of contentment, it only breeds more envy. It fuels anger, it harms, it hurts, it crushes, it smashes, and it kills. And it begins with just small things of resentment against another's achievements, and it will always end in affliction of harm. When we look at the anger that we've seen around our country this last year. You can see that there's a root of envy that is fueling a lot of that. Just becomes simply, I'm angry because there is a difference there and I won't be happy until they're without, for whatever reason. It's the opposite of living in love. In fact, it is, it is fueled by allowing hate to be in our heart. Doug read to us from James and from the chap from chapter three of, of James and and it's very appropriate. I encourage, encourage you to go back there and look at that again, where it talks about um, about wisdom. It says, "Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, by by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition," In your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. James says, if you, if you see a root of these things taking hold in your life, don't justify them. Don't, don't tell others or think that somehow you're justified in keeping that. Get it out. You must understand that the seeds of envy are being sown daily. Sometimes even in, in, in our life as a Christian, we, we have envy takes hold in our life. And we determine that, um, and sometimes we, we don't realize it's there. Sometimes it's a small thing. The Lord's convicted me at times of, of, of sometimes it's with individuals I don't even know. I hear something they've said, I read something they've written, and I think, well, they will always be a tool of the enemy. What do I know about that? See, I want, I want to live my life with this faith that knows and believes that the power of God is able to touch and change hearts and lives. I don't want to go to my prayer time looking at a list of individuals and pray and, and groups or whatever it might be and refuse to want to pray in earnest for them because I don't want the power of God to fall. I don't want that to be part of my life. So I want to ask you today to, do, uh, to begin to do a couple things this week as you, as you come before the Lord in prayer. First of all, I want you to, to commit to pray. We need to pray. 
We need to, to have a time where we come before the Lord aware of his holiness. And I want you to think about of his love for you. I want you to think about the fact that, that God has loved you. He's loved me with everything. At my, our lowest point, God still loved you. That's why we have the cross. And as you reflect on God's love for you, I want you to, uh, to in your prayer time, to, to really allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart. We prayed the Holy Spirit prayer this morning for a reason. I wanted us to, to hear those words about, about kindling uh, in us a fire of his love. You know, the fire of God will burn away that which is not of God. The Apostle Paul talks about the the acts of the sinful nature and and the fruit of the Spirit, right? And he says they can't coexist together. They'll wrestle with each other until one has victory over the other. Well, if you want to ensure the fruit of the Spirit is evident in your life, you need need to, to sow the fruit of the Spirit into your life. So as you come before him and pray, if God is touching your heart about an area that may be developing into envy, then we need to pray the fruit of the Spirit and that would counter that. Father, remind me of the joy that is found in you. Remind me of the fact that when I came to you as my Lord and Savior, you gave me joy and peace that is beyond understanding. And you changed a heart that was bent toward going the wrong way. You transformed my life. Father, right now, I don't want to see joy in this person's life that way because of whatever. And when you begin to name that and pray for it, you will realize how wrong that is. And God will convict you. And you will find that as you begin to talk with him about that, you'll be able to start praying for that. It doesn't mean, I'm not talking about allowing a person into your life that you know will tear it apart, but I'm just talking about you releasing from hating them and from being envious toward them and praying for them. God did not give us a spirit of fear, right? We're saying about that today. And we don't have to be a slave to it. We can be set free. So as we pray, as you pray, I want you to be able to, to spend time with him and pray through and wrestle through some of those hard things. And I want you to pray and ask the Holy Spirit to fill you and to continue to convict you and to do that fearless kind of inventory in your life. There's nothing greater than walking hand in hand with the Lord and letting him lead you. And I know this, as we pray these ways, we, we, we feel like we are, we are walking in a hard place sometimes. And we need to be led, but God will lead you and he's faithful. And God will not overwhelm you with more than you can begin to work with. He will put, you, will put specific things and places and people in your mind and you can begin to, to pray through those. And he will help you. Next week, we're going to, to go a little further with this. We're going to look at Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4. If you want to read ahead this week and, uh, and start preparing for that, I encourage you to do that. But I want, to, I want to go right now. I want to go to Psalm. I want to go to Psalm 37. And I want to pray with us this passage in, uh, and pray this scripture into our lives this morning. As we close, Psalm 37, I just want to read and pray through these first few verses of that chapter. It's a Psalm of David. David writes, Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass they will soon wither, like green plants they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Father, I think about these words, and I've been reflecting on them often, and I think about how David begins this psalm. He says, do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. And Father, I pray that you would move in my heart and our hearts, that we would, that we would stop being anxious about those whom we see who are, who are engaged in evil acts and decisions, our choices. Lord, maybe we, we, have, we can think of those who have wronged us or who have acted in a wrong way toward us or who have caused us harm. And it brings anxious thoughts to our hearts and our minds. 
And we desire sometimes, that we, we desire envious attitudes toward them, and we want to see, uh, we want to see them go without or somehow be, be treated as they deserve, and it begins to take hold in our life. Father, help us to release those things. David says, don't focus on that. And he reminds us that you, that you are over all things, and you are righteous, holy, just judge. So Lord, help us to trust in you, to trust in you with everything we have. And Lord, help us to, to do what is good, what is of you. And Lord, I pray that you would bring us to places where we know we are safe in your arms, where we know that you have brought us to a place where we can hear you, where we can have your spiritual nourishment. And Lord, I pray that you would grant us the desires of our heart and the desire of our heart would be rooted and established firmly in the love you have for us. Lord, because we are able to love, not because of my ability or our ability, but because you loved us and you know us. So Lord, I thank you for these, this passage and for this truth. And Lord, I pray these truths into our lives today. I pray that we would be able to reflect on this often. Lord, I pray that uh, this week you would... Uh, Help us to uh, spend time uh, praying and confessing our need for you and seeking for your Holy Spirit to fill us so we, may, so we may allow you to do a work into our life, looking into what we need to deal with and surrender to you. Father, thank you for meeting with us today. I pray that you would, uh, would use this word and continue to use it uh, to raise up your people. And we will give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here today.